tonight, severe storms heading into the holiday. Triple digit temperatures blanket the west and south as travel nightmares pile up heading into July 4th. We'll bring you all the details. Plus, what was the most challenging part about bringing this to fruition, this dream? I guess if I had to pinpoint, you know, the hardest part, of course, is the capital. They make up just 23 out of 5,400 banks nationwide. The crucial role black-owned banks play in minority communities across the country and what's being done to protect them from systemic risk. And our goal is to write an anthem, something that's representative of our country today. What if you had to make the country's national anthem from scratch? We speak to celebrated director Ryan Coogler on his newest documentary, Anthem, as he explores a new way to celebrate the country. And good evening, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth in for Lindsay Davis tonight, and thank you so much for streaming with us. And we're following those stories and much more tonight, including the mass shooting over the weekend in Baltimore and the developments on the investigation there. Plus, Israel launches the biggest strike on the West Bank in more than two decades, carrying out multiple airstrikes and deploying hundreds of troops, prompting the Palestinian Authority's president to call it a war crime. What's behind those strikes is straight ahead. Also, we'll talk about the world's tallest, fastest roller coaster in North Carolina came to a halt after that, a crack spotted. Well, now there are new questions about what the amusement park knew and when. Our correspondents are fanned out around the world covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we do begin with the extreme weather. As Americans celebrate the 4th of July far and wide, powerful storms are firing up in the Northeast this afternoon and into tonight with thunderstorm watches from their Carolinas to New York. And that's after at least three tornadoes touched down in Pennsylvania. The holiday heat wave also continues to cook with alerts in 13 states that have forced millions to seek relief throughout this long weekend. And while the TSA is already reporting an extremely busy holiday stretch at the nation's airports, this summer's July 4th travel rush isn't over yet. And we'll get to Rob here with tomorrow's forecast in just a minute, but we do want to begin with a long-term home and ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, severe weather causing headaches for millions on the eve of the July 4th holiday. 37 million Americans on the East Coast under severe storm watches tonight from New York to North Carolina. If you're at the beach, grab everything and head inside. Powerful bands of rain, wind and hail rolling into the region. Over the weekend, the same system bringing dangerous flash flooding to Chicago, prompting water rescues. Nine inches falling in just a matter of hours. More rainfall than the city saw in the past two months combined. Cars stranded. Homes and businesses like this flower shop inundated. It looks around like 10 to 12 feet right now of water. Multiple tornadoes tore through central Pennsylvania Sunday, one shearing off the roof of this store. All of a sudden, I've seen the trees break off over there and flying through the air. And in North Carolina, this driver thankful to have escaped unharmed when a tree fell onto her car as storms swept through the area. This as blistering temperatures persist across the south and west. 13 states under heat alerts, heat indices over 100 degrees on both coasts, even the typically temperate Pacific Northwest. It was so humid and hot, and um, it was just very difficult to walk. And after bad weather caused mass flight cancellations last week, stranding hundreds of thousands of passengers. I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm working on almost no sleep. The TSA saying today it has so far screened nearly 11 million passengers over the holiday weekend, with Friday being its busiest day ever. And Stephanie Ramos is joining us now. Stephanie, we saw that air traffic snarl. It caused a lot of issues for so many people last week. How have these storms impacted air travel so far? Well, Kena, so far we haven't seen anything close to what we saw at airports last week. Today, there were less than 200 flights canceled, far below the more than 2,000 flight cancellations we saw a week ago. Kena. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Of course, though, another big question here is what will conditions be like for tomorrow's 4th of July festivities? Let's get right to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano. Hey, Rob. 
Hi, Canada. Well, once again, it de really depends where you live, but there are going to be some thunderstorms that do pop up throughout the day tomorrow. Uh, that storm that brought the record rain in Chicago is bringing thunderstorms to much of the east, including here in New York Metro. We've got a severe thunderstorm watch up until 8 o'clock, and as you'll see, that stretches all the way up state into the capital district of Albany, and a larger, more dynamic severe thunderstorm watch is up for Philly, Atlantic City, Baltimore, back through Richmond and North Carolina. Uh, that's up until 10, and they, they had a storm rolled through Norfolk that produced 60-plus mile per hour wind. So these are strong enough to bring down some trees and certainly some power lines. So be prepared for that. Lesser storms, I think, tomorrow, but they'll be around. Tomorrow, the 4th, we will reset the severe thunderstorm threat for the Midwest. Minneapolis back through Denver, damaging winds, large hail, and isolated tornadoes possible. And that does progress to the east on the 5th and 6th. And the heat remains dangerous in the southwest. We had a confirmed fatality in the Grand Canyon uh, from, a, from a hiker there yesterday. And dangerous heat remains in Las Vegas and Phoenix, 110 plus. And uh, that's measured in the shade and excessive heat warnings up, up through at least the holiday, if not beyond, into the midweek. Kana. All right, Rob, our thanks to you. Now to a mass shooting at a holiday weekend block party in Baltimore that left at least two dead and nearly 30 wounded. Most of them are teenagers. Tonight, authorities are appealing to the public for help. Here's ABC's Ike Jachi. Man, they started banging out here, bro. Tonight, the manhunt intensifying after a mass shooting at a Baltimore block party that killed two people and injured two dozen more. For the record, we don't have control of the scene. We don't have control. Tonight, police say multiple weapons were involved, and they believe more than one suspect. The reward growing. Now $28,000 for information leading to an arrest. We won't stop until we find those responsible and hold them accountable. Just after midnight Sunday, police were called about a shooting at what they describe as an unsanctioned block party. Witnesses telling us they heard 20 to 30 shots fired. Police say 18-year-old Alia Gonzalez died at the scene. 20-year-old Kylie's Fagbemi died later at a hospital. 28 other victims also treated, more than half between the ages of 13 and 17. We have uh, seven people that are still inpatient. Four of them remain in critical condition. It is devastating and it's hurtful. I'm tired of my people killing one another. This woman, who wanted to remain anonymous, says she was driving, looking for her own family when the shooting happened. And two injured girls came to her for help. And zoomed them to the hospital, and I kept telling the girl, just baby, just breathe in and out. And tonight, while his city heals, the mayor says this is not just a Baltimore problem. We have to be honest. This is the United States of America. This is our longest standing public health challenge, and we need to focus on gun violence regardless of where it happens. And Ike Ajachi is joining us now from Baltimore. Ike, are police now worried about any more violence as we head right into the 4th of July tomorrow? That's right, Kana. Police say they're on the lookout for possible retaliation from this incident, and they're also keeping an extra eye on the city given the long holiday weekend. Now, no arrests have been made, and law enforcement are still searching for a motive. Kana? All right, a scary situation, Ike. Thank you. There are now major developments unfolding in the Mideast tonight. Israel has launched the biggest strike on the West Bank in more than two decades, saying it has deployed drones and 2,000 troops to target militant strongholds. The death toll is rising, and there are concerns that this escalation is just beginning. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman has more. Tonight, Israel's largest military operation into Palestinian territory in years is underway. Israeli defense forces have mounted multiple air and drone strikes on Jenin City in the occupied West Bank. As many as 2,000 Israeli troops sent in engaged in street battles, targeting what they call terrorist infrastructure in the refugee camp next to the city. Precision is difficult, with 17,000 people living in less than a quarter square mile. Palestinian officials say eight people have been killed and more than 60 injured. The Israeli raid today was a very tough one, this man says. Tough for medics as well as civilians inside the camp. Jenin has become a symbol of Palestinian resistance, disillusioned with the Palestinian Authority, who they feel has failed them. Some young men joined terror groups who've carried out attacks against Israelis in more than a year of escalating violence. We are striking uh, the terrorism hub with a great strength.
Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has called on Israel to stop the aggression, saying it's Israel that sponsors terrorism in the region. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's facing ongoing protests, is under pressure by far-right members of his government who believe the entire West Bank should be under Israeli control. Tonight, he's pledged to continue this operation as long as required. And James is joining me now. James, talk to me about the timing here. Why are the Israelis going on the offensive now? Yeah, OK, now the timing of all this is super important. Look, there is no doubt Jenin has become a centre of operations for terrorists. The Palestinian Authority, supposed to be in charge of the occupied West Bank, they have lost control of that area. It is now run by terror groups. And we've seen an escalation of violence over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, terror terrorists targeting Israeli citizens. Uh, and so the Israelis say that they have wanted to target this place for months. The IDF actually said today that they've had... Uh, certain areas inside Jenin camp in their sites, labs, uh, other infrastructure for the terrorists, and they've wanted to launch this attack for some time. But it is also true that there are internal Israeli politics at play as well. Benjamin Netanyahu is under pressure. He has members of his uh, coalition, the far right uh, members of his coalition, who've wanted him to pass these judicial reforms. They have been stalled. There have been massive protests on the streets. He hasn't been able to deliver that for them. So, and Analysts look at this and say, well, what else has he been able to deliver for the far right? A raid on Jenin could be just that. But he has to be careful because this kind of action could spark a much wider uh, violent reaction from other terror groups uh, across the region, most especially Hamas in Gaza. Kena. All right, James, thank you for that perspective as always. And now to the war in Ukraine, where Ukrainian forces are reclaiming more ground in their counteroffensive against Russia. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel got a rare look at how U.S. weapons and equipment, including American howitzers and Bradley fighting vehicles, are helping Ukraine push back Russian fighters. Tonight, Ukrainian forces advancing. ABC News given rare access to American-supplied long-range howitzer artillery guns blasting Russian positions near Bakhmut in the east, where Ukraine says gains are now being made. You can feel the power of that weapon. You can actually feel the physical force inside your chest. We're very close to the front lines in Bakhmut, a few miles away, and these kind of weapons that have come from America, the troops here say, make a huge difference. America. This commander, nicknamed Docent, thanking America for helping with weapons, ammunition and support, saying good morale is a powerful weapon too. Ukraine's 47th Brigade on the southern front around Zaporizhia is also using American military equipment, like this Bradley fighting vehicle firing on Russian positions. Russia releasing these videos showing drones striking Bradleys say it's proof the Ukrainian counteroffensive is being stopped. But Ukraine says those Western vehicles do save soldiers' lives. Here, a Bradley is in flames, yet the soldiers inside still escape. Andre, one of two Bradley drivers we met from the 47th Brigade, confirming that this video posted by the Russians shows a drone loaded with explosives flying right over his Bradley and striking the one behind him. Andre's Bradley ultimately hit as well, struck three times by mortars. He was hospitalized, but here, returning to the battlefield the very next day to retrieve his Bradley. What difference has it made having them? And what are they like? It's a great vehicle, he says. We were hit multiple times and my entire crew is alive. If you hadn't had the Bradley fighting vehicles, do you think you would be standing here now? No. Their one word answer, no. Kena, artillery, tank and infantry soldiers that we've met all say that they're still probing for weak spots, that the main thrust in this counteroffensive has yet to come. And until those American and other Western fighter jets appear, the Ukrainians concede that the going is going to be slow and bloody. Kena. All right, Ian, incredible access. Thank you so much. And also today, ABC chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raditz sat down with the commander of Ukraine's ground forces. General Oleksandr Sersky says they discussed a counteroffensive, talked about the challenges ahead and the Wagner groups. Here's some of that conversation. General, thank you. You are just back from Bakhmut. Can you describe the fight to me? what it is like 
for your soldiers what the Russians are like? Взагалі, це процес і дуже складний процес. Не випадково проведення будь-якої операції називається і включає оперативне мистецтво. Це окрема наука. Тому я можу сказати, що з нашого боку це боротьба за звільнення нашої території, нашої держави, нашої батьківщини. З боку противника це ну, суто загарбницька війна, але ж вона набула настільки жорсткого характеру, що це процес... Це процес ну, дуже складний, дуже кривавий. Ну, і в першу чергу, в першу чергу ми, просто, ми розуміємо, що правда за нами, тому ми обов'язково переможемо. You think you can take back uh, yes, of course. I sure. Do you feel pressure from the US or allies to move faster? У нас, я ж сказав, у нас, у нас немає такого, щоб нас хтось підштовхував. Є моє бажання, є бажання моїх підлеглих. І, і ми розуміємо, що нам хочеться от сьогодні досягнути, от, наприклад, вийти на якийсь рубіж. Але я тому і буваю постійно в військах, я розумію. А одне, ти десь в спокійному місці це вирішив, а інша справа – це практично виконати, виконати в умовах шаленого опіру противника. How much longer will this go on? I don't know. Let's talk about uh, Prigozhin and your reaction to what he did and what you think will happen now with his army. Ну, на нашу ситуацію це ніяким чином не вплине. Тому що зараз у нас немає Вагнеру, він відійшов ще більше місяця тому. Ну, тому цей його заколот, він ніяким чином не вплинув на хід бойових дій в смузі відповідальності моєго угруповання. От. А як він вплине на події в Росії, якщо воно вплинуло і там стало б гірше, нам би було б краще. Так що it doesn't matter for me. I think the history of Wagner will be closed, will be finished. You think Wagner is finished? Yeah. And our thanks to Martha Raddatz for that. Also, U.S. Ambassador to Russia Lynn Tracy was allowed to visit the imprisoned Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich today. Gerskovich, who was arrested back in March, is being held on espionage charges after a Moscow court ordered him to remain in custody until at least August 30th. Tracy last visited him in April. He denies the charges, and U.S. officials say he is being wrongfully detained. Gerskovich is the first American reporter to face espionage charges in Russia since 1986. Also, officials in France hope that the tide may be finally turning after a week of violence in the streets. Protests over the police shooting of a 17-year-old in suburban Paris have spread throughout the country, with 99 town halls attacked, buildings destroyed, a burning car rammed into one French mayor's home. More than 3,300 arrests have been made nationwide. Now, in response, crowds have begun to gather at several targeted locations to show solidarity with authorities. Also, authorities in Florida have now released new body camera video of the neighbor charged with allegedly shooting and killing a mother of two, firing a shot through her own door. The video shows deputies responding to numerous calls leading up to this deadly confrontation. Our Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest, including what the accused shooter said about the children living next door. Tonight, body camera video revealing new details about the feud between two Florida neighbors that turned deadly. She calls constantly. Susan Lawrence making multiple calls to authorities about Ajika A.J. Owens and her children for more than a year before she was charged with shooting and killing her. 
put the call through. I called because the lady across the street on the phone hit me with a sign. In February of last year, Susan Lawrence alleging Owens picked up a no trespassing sign and threw it at her as she walked her dog on Lawrence's property. Sheriff deputies asking Owens for her side. I picked the sign up and I threw the sign. I literally picked the sign up and as I walked on, I threw the sign. I said, and I can go and buy a sign too. It still doesn't okay. mean anything. In April, Lawrence accusing Owens and her children of stealing her mail, calling her names and trespassing. How are you? Aggravated. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, I've got young ladies who just keep coming by and think it's hysterical while I'm working to um, bring their animals and scream while I'm on the phone. But police say on June 2nd, that feud turned deadly. Lawrence confronting Owens's children for playing a field near her residence. Lawrence allegedly throwing an iPad and skates at the children. When Owens later knocked at Lawrence's home, her 10-year-old son standing at her side, police say the neighbor fired a single shot through the front door, striking Owens in the chest and killing her. Lawrence charged with manslaughter and arraigned wearing a green suicide prevention vest. The sheriff's department saying she's been listed as a suicide risk. And our thanks to Mona Kosar Abdi. A federal civil rights complaint was filed today against Harvard, calling for an investigation into legacy and donor-related admissions. This comes just days after the 6-3 decision by the Supreme Court to end race-based affirmative action. That was a ruling already forcing schools to rethink how they attract now a diverse student body. So I want to welcome in Dr. Michael Drake, the 21st president of the University of California system and the first black president to hold that post. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Drake, and UC schools do not give preference to legacy candidates, but do you think that it's time for all colleges to stop legacy admissions to level the playing field? We haven't used legacy admissions for quite some time, and it works very well for us, and I think everyone else could apply this as well, but we, we haven't used it for, for years. Well, California became the first state to also ban affirmative action in 1996, and you know others will now be looking for guidance. What is the learning curve going to look like, do you think? It took us a few years to learn how to evaluate candidates in a comprehensive manner that let us look at those things which we thought would make them the strongest applicants to our universities. And, and by doing that, we've been able to now uh, do a good job of increasing our diversity since the time of the affirmative action ban in, in the 1990s. So it took us a few years, but we've had some practice as of other states, and we're happy to share that experience. Well, President Biden also proposed that adversity scores become a new standard in admissions. And the UC Davis Medical School has been using a socioeconomic disadvantage scale to attract diversity. It rates every applicant from zero to 99, taking into account life circumstances, things like family income, parental education. Could a policy like that, do you think, also work on a broader scale? Yeah, I think that that's worked well for UC Davis, and it's, you know, we're continuing to evaluate and try to perfect those things. But in all cases, what we're doing is looking at the life circumstances of the applicant and evaluating those and then trying to do our best job in picking the appropriate applicants to join us. And we have really outstanding students doing this, really outstanding classes that are doing quite well. So we think this is quite promising. And UC schools made the decision in 2021 not to require SAT scores. Is there any evidence whether that is helping diversify the applicant pool? We did find that when we removed away from using the SAT as a, as a, a barrier step that we had an increase in applications from uh, groups of students that had been underrepresented in, in the past. And, you know, this is new for us. It's just two years and it's during the pandemic, so we're still evaluating it. But what I'll say is that since doing that, we still have an incredibly outstanding students who are doing quite well, so, so we find it quite promising. And Dr. Drake, I know you said you'd be ready and willing to help other universities as they navigate this new uh, future that we have in front of us. Have you heard from any administrators yet? You know, I'm in constant contact with colleagues from different universities, as I have been for all these years. And so we've all been talking about this really for, for many months as these cases were winding their way through the courts. And we are having conversations about how we might, again, convene and, and talk about ways that we can continue to be inclusive, outstanding universities. You know, that's our goal always is to be the best university we can be. And now that affirmative action has gone away, what do you think does that mean for the landscape of higher education in America? Well, I think that higher education is very important to our country. And if we're going to be the strongest and best 
universities we can be, if we're going to be the best educators for our citizenry, we want to make sure that we're inclusive. So the real role, role for all of us is to work together to make sure that we know that you know, uh, opportunity is not distributed equally across zip codes, but talent is, and we want to make sure that we go to all parts of our society and, and have there be a pathway for people to continue to come and learn with us, and we'll work with our colleagues to do the best we can to do that. Well said, Dr. Michael Drake. We appreciate your time. Good to see you. And we have a lot more to get to here tonight on Prime. The biggest roller coaster in the country is shut down after a crack was spotted right there in the support beam. We have new details as officials try to find the cause. But next in our Prime Focus, black Americans have historically been shut out of receiving many of the benefits of the banking system with Black-owned businesses half as likely as white-owned businesses to receive the financing they request. The saving grace for many, banks owned by people from their own community. I recognize how we were not able to get funding the way I saw from my white counterparts getting funding. Recognizing the importance of having support um, from a Black institution, it does matter. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. The National Football League recently announced they would be taking out some $78 million in loans from minority-owned banks in this country, touting it as a way to provide new economic opportunities to the financial institutions and as a way to invest in black communities. Now, it was a welcome shot in the arm after this spring saw several regional bank failures sending shockwaves through the economy as concerns surfaced over the health of our nation's financial institutions. So in tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Morgan Norwood delves into the history and the importance of black-owned banks and financial institutions for minority communities. So when you think about like the way coffee goes, you start with espresso, people like, you know, just basic, give me that coffee shot. I always say like, if a latte is the margarita, the espresso is the tequila. When it comes to coffee, it's a passion. I fell in love with the way coffee brings people together. Brewing for a while. But Dorian Bolden's journey from banker to barista. I'm leaving my job on Wall Street. I'm moving in with my girlfriend uh, in North Carolina. I have no job. Yeah, it freaked everybody out. Wasn't always an easy grind. My father was in the hospital in Atlanta and flew down to, to see him. Uh, didn't realize that was going to be the last time I saw him. So, you know, his unexpected passing just made me realize tomorrow's not guaranteed. 
and I wanted to be kind of in control of my own path, and that's what I think for me was the seed of entrepreneurship. Dorian now using espresso to express himself, opening BU Cafe in downtown Durham, North Carolina in 2009. What was the most challenging part about bringing this to fruition, this dream? I guess if I had to pinpoint, you know, the hardest part, of course, is the capital. Minority depositories, also known as black-owned banks and credit unions, were born out of that struggle to find capital. After the end of slavery, black Americans were largely shut out of American banks. So between 1865 and 1934, more black-owned banks and credit unions surfaced across the country. The Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, would become home to what is known as Black Wall Street. But in 1921, it was burned to the ground by white supremacists in a violent race massacre. But Tulsa wasn't home to the only Black Wall Street. We traveled to historic downtown Durham, where Mechanic and Farmers Bank, the second oldest minority depository in the country, is still open today. So, Jim, it's 1908. Paint the picture for Black Wall Street. What was it like here in Durham? It was an unbelievable ecosystem. What's interesting is that people from all around the country, political leaders, governmental leaders, business leaders wanted to see what was going on here in Durham on Black Wall Street. I'm just doing an interview, but customers come first. So yeah, you get priority, you know what I mean? So you keep us going. With Dorian expanding his business, adding two new locations at Raleigh Durham Airport, he decided to work with MNF Bank to secure funding. I recognize how we were not able to get funding the way I saw from my white counterparts getting funding. Recognizing the importance of having support um, from a black institution, it does matter. According to a 2022 report by the Federal Reserve, black owned businesses were about half as likely as white owned businesses to receive all or most of the financing they requested. When a black entrepreneur has excess capital, the studies have shown that they actually outperform uh, white businesses. Bill Bynum is the CEO and one of the founding members of Hope Credit Union, a black owned depository in Mississippi. If you look at where slaveholding was concentrated prior to the Civil War and look at that map and then look at a map today where you have the highest concentrations of payday lenders, of check cashes, the lowest education, health outcomes, the worst housing conditions, highest unemployment, and it's an eerie resemblance. You can't buy a house. You can't support your family using payday lenders and check cashes. You just don't have the financial tools that other people take for granted to help you climb the economic ladder. And a major key to building wealth, home ownership. A dream Debbie Jones achieved in Pearl, Mississippi. There is nothing better than owning your own home, relaxing, enjoying your family, having family outings, and all that good stuff. Sounds like something that you've wanted for a while. Yes, ma'am. That was a dream of your mom's? Dream of my mom's and mine. But after multiple closed doors, Debbie says she began questioning if her dream would ever become a reality after she says she was denied a home loan from a well-known mortgage company. But that particular loan company stated that they denied me because I didn't have the income. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had the income. Debbie ended up going to Hope Credit Union. She says their institution used the same criteria as the first mortgage company she tried, yet she was instantly approved. I didn't understand why I was denied. And with me working in the insurance industries, I've heard and I've seen a lot of things. A lot of people have been disenfranchised or been denied certain things because of the color of your skin. If your annual income on your household of $150,000 and you're black, you're more likely to be turned down for mortgage loan than if you're white with a thirty dollars to $40,000 income. So there are disparities, systemic discrimination in the financial system. And while minority depositories are working to close the racial wealth gap, the recent bank failures of Silicon Valley, First Republic, and Signature Bank have raised concerns over the health of our nation's banking system. A new study suggests that almost 190 U.S. banks, including community and minority depositories, could face a similar fate if just half of their depositors took their money out. 
Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. It's such an important topic. Nicole Elam is the president of the National Bankers Association, a trade group advocating for minority depositories. Today, small banks have $291 billion less in deposits than they did in March uh, at the start of the bank failures. And so while the deposit flight declined in, in terms of after the first couple of weeks after the bank failures, you saw a huge deposit flight. It then stabilized, but deposits is something these banks need. We have not had a run on deposits, but we are having conversations with some of our depositors who uh, are obviously nervous. Most community banks like MNF Bank, um, we're safe, we're sound, and our business models are not risky. We're taking deposits locally and relending those deposits out to the communities that we serve. But the challenges for minority depositories to build and sustain capital remain. We are all too familiar with systemic racism and how it's impacted not just policies, but how it's impacted people's perceptions and people's psychology. But there has been some relief. Congress is investing $12 billion into minority depositories through the Emergency Capital Investment Program. And just this month, the Economic Opportunity Coalition pulled together $1 billion in private sector funding. But experts say this is just a start. One of the things that I would encourage the federal government to do, and even on the state and local level, is to make deposits in black and minority banks. Black banks are safe. We can make our own deposits in those banks. So I think that that's something that they can do. So in the same way a shot of espresso builds a cappuccino, black-owned depositories build communities. For us, when we say BU and our, you know, our mantra is without community, it's just coffee. The fact that we have team members who started as a, as a host and now they're, you know, senior leaders in second houses they purchased, like having a salary, like being able to see people grow and develop and have a financial future, that's community. It, it was a dream come true, it was wonderful. It's something, a legacy, something that I can leave my children. I'm just happy I was able to bring it to life with my kids and grandkids and my mom. Sadly, she only enjoyed the home for five months. I thought I was going to have my mom up until oh, late 80s, you know. I'm sorry, y'all. But I know she's my angel now. And she's watching over me. I know she's really proud of you. She is. I know she is. She's, she's looking down on me. Mama's got a shot, too. Our thanks to Morgan Norwood for that. We have a lot more to get to here tonight. Coming up, several Washington, D.C. businesses have been targeted with explosives. The urgent search for the suspect. Plus, what would our national anthem sound like if it was written today? The minds behind a new documentary tell us about the journey to understand the different sounds of America. But next, older men are leading much of the summer's movie lineup. We take a look at the actors dominating the box office by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! Somebody if I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. 
With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. This summer, older men are leading the movie lineups. It started this weekend with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Here's a look at the silver hair dominating the silver screen by the numbers. At 80 years old, Harrison Ford is leading the Indiana Jones franchise into its fifth film, which brought in $60 million over its opening weekend in the U.S. And six-year-old Tom Cruise will be pulling off stunts in Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, the franchise's seventh installment hits theaters next week and 68 year old Denzel Washington will dole out vigilante justice in the Equalizer 3 to be released in September and when entertainment research company NRG asked fans spanning three generations who they most want to watch in a theater the answer was stars from the 1980s in fact 19 of the top 20 movie stars people most wanted to see were over 40 years old. Tom Cruise had the highest seat filling potential, followed by 51 year old Dwayne The Rock Johnson and 66 year old Tom Hanks. Morgan Freeman, who is 86, also made the top list. And while Hollywood's aging men seem to be dominating the screen, leading roles for women over 45 remain rare. In 2021, you were nearly four times more likely to see an older male than female in the lead, according to the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative. The only bright spot here is those roles seem to be improving. Stars like 85-year-old Jane Fonda, 77-year-old Helen Mirren, and six-year-old Michelle Yeoh are all drawing viewers with strong older female roles. Now the longtime leading men and women of Hollywood giving a new meaning to the adage, oldie but goodie. We have a lot more ahead here on Prime tonight. A new test that could help detect a life-threatening condition, preeclampsia. We'll talk about what the FDA just approved. And the back and forth over restrictions on how many posts Twitter users can view, where things stand now. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. 
Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? How <laughs> cute. <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. A dangerous discovery on the country's biggest roller coaster. The search for the suspect who threw explosives at several businesses. And a new test could be a game changer for pregnant women. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. The investigation continues into a crack discovered on one of the biggest roller coasters in the country. The Fury 325 at Kara Winds in North Carolina was shut down for the weekend after a fracture was discovered in a support beam. Multiple videos on social media show the apparent crack with the coaster passing close by. WSOC reported that a team from the North Carolina Department of Labor was joining the investigation at the park. It's unclear what caused the crack and when the ride would be repaired and reopened. Washington, D.C. police are looking for a suspect who allegedly threw explosives at multiple businesses in the district. The Metropolitan Police Department said the suspect detonated explosives outside of a Truist Bank ATM and a Nike store, then threw a Molotov cocktail-style object at a Safeway store, all in a 15-minute span early Sunday morning. Police said three businesses were damaged by the explosives, but were closed at the time. No injuries were reported, and sources tell ABC News the explosives appear to be isolated to these three incidents. More changes at Twitter. Owner Elon Musk saying AI companies have been using content to train their language models. So the platform will now limit how many daily tweets a user can read. A thousand for unverified accounts and 10,000 for page subscribers. Those numbers are up considerably from Musk's original limits announced Saturday of 6,000 posts for verified accounts and just 600 posts for unverified accounts. Musk's original tweet described the limits as temporary, but did not indicate how long they would be in place. 
A blood test recently approved by the FDA could help doctors identify if a pregnant woman might develop the life-threatening condition preeclampsia. The test may help doctors determine if a woman will develop the condition within two weeks. Preeclampsia happens when a pregnant woman with normal blood pressure suddenly develops high blood pressure after 20 weeks of pregnancy. It occurs in one out of every 25 pregnancies in the U.S. at a rate 60% higher for black women than white women. Walgreens says it plans to cut costs by closing 150 U.S. stores. The company has nearly 9,000 stores in the U.S. About 1,100 of them are operating with reduced hours. The cost-cutting measures come amid the pharmacy giant's release of its third quarter earnings, which revealed that its net earnings were down compared to the same period last year. Walgreens is also reportedly planning to close 300 locations in the U.K. Robert De Niro's 19-year-old grandson, Leandro De Niro Rodriguez, has died. Leandro's death was confirmed by both his grandfather and his mother, actress Drina De Niro. No cause of death has been given. Leandro appeared with his mother in films including A Star is Born. Robert De Niro said in a statement that he was deeply distressed by the passing of his beloved grandson. And also tonight, as Americans prepare to celebrate the 4th of July, two musicians take a journey around the country to some of the most celebrated musical cities and write their own anthem with the diverse sounds of the nation. Stephanie Ramos sat down with the pair behind it all. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. The symbolic importance of the anthem for so many people emotionally moves me. Traveling through the country to connect with different musicians. Our goal is to write an anthem, something that's representative of our country today. In this film, you follow two incredible musicians studying the national anthem. How did you come up with this idea to try and come up with a new national anthem? People have passionate, positive, and negative feelings about the song, but pretty quickly, I got into a state of mind because I'm a creator uh, of not thinking about the Star Spangled Banner itself, but thinking about the creation of, a, of an anthem for today and what would that be. And then that quickly got into this notion of like a journey, a film that's a journey of a road trip. And Ryan, what was that process like for you when you were approached with the idea of coming up with a new national anthem? For us at Fox, we're just trying to bring audiences in closer proximity to stories that are often overlooked. For us, it was just about supporting them. What, what we loved about it, um, and what makes us proud of the film, is it examines a question, um, but then actually tries to do something about it. You know, um, tries to be pr proactive and, and constructive, um, and, and it's very brave in, in, in that and in, in ambitious. You know, uh, we were really, really happy with the song that was, you know, that was made out as a result of it. So now, as you guys are coming up with a new national anthem, was that a concern at all, that there would be this sort of backlash from people that want to keep a traditional... I don't think so. I, don't, you think it's, I think, think you awesome. always offend somebody, no matter what side of the fence you're on. Not really. I mean, like, the, the thing that was so exciting about it was the, pro the, crea the creative process. Like, I I'm a filmmaker, and every time I start a film, I get incredibly excited about the potential to create something, even if it's stepping into difficult spaces. Sort of taking a non-polemic approach to the storytelling and putting the humanity behind these issues forward. So that's sort of the state of mind that we went into. It wasn't even so much thinking so deeply about what made America so divided about this song, but by the potential of creating a song for today, an anthem for today, that was a reflection of the diversity of the country. Let's get some vocals down. And Ryan, what were your thoughts? And did you at all think about how it would be received? No. Yeah, like, um, we got a lot of faith in Pete as a filmmaker. The film, um, it, it, it is one that, 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 that is made with a sense of optimism, you know, um, and honesty. Uh, and, and, and as I was, you know, the film kind of starts with, with a little bit of education about the, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and you learn what its origins are and the roots of it, um, just musically, and the fact that the music is from a, a British drinking song. The prospect of, you know, making something, a, a song about us today, you know, that, that, that um, is inspired by the roots of American music, you know, music that's, 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 um, that's from here. You know, we were excited about that. Like, like in, in, in Pete, is always um, uh, an honest filmmaker, but, but one that approaches things from a place of optimism. 
or jump in with joy to get into it, to be honest with you. Let's talk about the musicians that you paired up to go on this journey, how you came up with these, these two brilliant minds to tour the country and try to come up with a national anthem. What was that process like? Kind of coincidentally, I had known Chris for a number of years. Proximity has, has worked with Chris. He scored the, the, their, their Space Jam Space movie. Jam. Yes. Um, he, he's just a, a remarkably gifted young um, uh, composer and jazz pianist. So the film goes to some of the country's most iconic cities from uh, Detroit, Nashville, New Orleans, also the state of Oklahoma. There's so many different voices and sounds in this country. What was that process like in trying to decide what goes into this anthem? What pieces of the country will go into this new national anthem? It, it was an evolution and, you know, as a team, we had to reflect on, the, on, on that question because right off the bat, it seems impossible <laughs> to do, to have a song that represents everyone's experience. And what we decided was that we wanted to come up with a framework that could create something that, that's malleable, that could be transferable. The questions of genre, location, we couldn't check every, every, every box, but that we wanted to create an idea that could be adopted and I'm adopted. I was, a, I was literally adopted as, 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 as a child. My birth mother was white, my birth father, father was black, and I was raised by a black family. And I think that that spirit is so much about what we're trying in our country, struggling to sort of make connections across racial stories, across class stories, um, historical stories. But we knew there, there were some roots in there, that we knew, we knew Native American music, we knew that blues was some sort of root. And so there were choices that we made and there were other places that where we couldn't necessarily rock music, we didn't delve into hip hop. So um, some of those decisions were difficult, but we, we believe we've created a framework that could be transferable so that, you know, artists from those genres could take this, this song, do a rendition of it and make it their own. Do you think it's a, it's an accurate representation of where we are today? It's an expression, it, it, it's, um, it's like a, a, a frame on the quilt, you know, and, and it's so interesting. Even the Star Spangled Banner in its performance, people make it their own. And e even though the, the, the melody's there and, and the, the lyrics are there, you can see Jimi Hendrix perform it. Jose Feliciano. Marvin Gaye. Whitney Houston. What they're doing is they're sort of recognizing a sort of disconnect from the foundation of the song with their lived experience. And I think the intention behind saying, well, what is an anthem? What is the American story? Um, not only led to this particular song, but also leads to the reality that there is not just one, and there shouldn't be just one anthem, you know, for, for a nation as diverse and complicated as, as America. And our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that conversation. And that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kana Whitworth, and thank you for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, what the French justice minister is now pushing for after clashes between police and demonstrators over the shooting of a teenager by an officer. And Kelly Clarkson opens up about an emotional time in her life, what she says helped her to put her mental health first during her divorce. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Who do you want to prank? Oh my God, here we go. We're being pranked on camera. <laughs> I'll catch ya, I'll catch ya.
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Kana Whitworth in for Lindsay Davis tonight, and thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, and that includes the triple-digit temperatures blanketing the West and the South and severe weather impacting parts of the country as travel nightmares pile up heading into July 4th. We'll bring you all those details. Plus, the counteroffensive against Russia may be working for Ukraine. Martha Raditz joins us with an extended sit down with one of the generals directing that offensive. And hey, break out your Pimm's cups, get your strawberries and cream ready. With Wimbledon kicking off today in the UK, we'll bring you the details on its inaugural day when we go around the world. But we do begin with the extreme weather on the eve of this 4th of July. Powerful storms have been firing up in the Northeast this afternoon and into tonight as the holiday heat wave continues to cook. Millions sweltering through alerts in 13 states. And tonight, officials keeping a close eye on the Tunnel 5 fire. It's in Washington state. Already hundreds of residents have been ordered to evacuate. And so we'll get to Rob here in just a moment with tomorrow's forecast. But this holiday travel rush isn't done yet. ABC's Stephanie Ramos leads us off with a long trip home. Tonight, severe weather causing headaches for millions on the eve of the July 4th holiday. 37 million Americans on the East Coast under severe storm watches tonight from New York to North Carolina. If you're at the beach, grab everything and head inside. Powerful bands of rain, wind and hail rolling into the region. Over the weekend, the same system bringing dangerous flash flooding to Chicago, prompting water rescues. Nine inches falling in just a matter of hours. More rainfall than the city saw in the past two months combined. Cars stranded. Homes and businesses like this flower shop inundated. Looks around like 
10 to 12 feet right now of water. Multiple tornadoes tore through central Pennsylvania Sunday, one shearing off the roof of this store. All of a sudden, I seen the trees break off over there and flying through the air. And in North Carolina, this driver thankful to have escaped unharmed <laughs> when a tree fell onto her car as storms swept through the area. This, as blistering temperatures persist across the south and west, 13 states under heat alerts, heat indices over 100 degrees on both coasts, even the typically temperate Pacific Northwest. It was so humid and hot, and um, it was just very difficult to walk. And after bad weather caused mass flight cancellations last week, stranding hundreds of thousands of passengers. I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm working on almost no sleep. The TSA saying today it has so far screened nearly 11 million passengers over the holiday weekend, with Friday being its busiest day ever. And Stephanie Ramos is joining us now. Stephanie, we saw that air traffic snarl. It caused a lot of issues for so many people last week. How have these storms impacted air travel so far? Well, Kena, so far we haven't seen anything close to what we saw at airports last week. Today, there were less than 200 flights canceled, far below the more than 2,000 flight cancellations we saw a week ago. Kena. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Of course, though, another big question here is what will conditions be like for tomorrow's 4th of July festivities? Let's get right to ABC's senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Hey, Rob. Hi, Kenna. Well, once again, it really depends where you live, but there are going to be some thunderstorms that do pop up throughout the day tomorrow. Uh, that storm that brought the record rain to Chicago is bringing thunderstorms to much of the east, including here in New York Metro. We've got a severe thunderstorm watch up until 8 o'clock, and as you'll see, that stretches all the way up state into the capital district of Albany, and a larger, more dynamic severe thunderstorm watch is up for Philly, Atlantic City, Baltimore, back through Richmond and North Carolina. Uh, that's up until 10, and they, they had a storm roll through Norfolk that produced 60-plus mile per our wind. So these are strong enough to bring down some trees and certainly some power lines. So be prepared for that. Lesser storms, I think, tomorrow, but they'll be around. Tomorrow, the 4th, we will reset the severe thunderstorm threat for the Midwest. Minneapolis back through Denver, damaging winds, large hail, and isolated tornadoes possible. And that does progress to the east on the 5th and 6th. And the heat remains dangerous in the southwest. We had a confirmed fatality in the Grand Canyon uh, from, a, from a hiker there yesterday. And dangerous heat remains in Las Vegas and Phoenix, 110 plus. And uh, that's measured in the shade and excessive heat warnings up, up through at least the holiday, if not beyond, into the midweek. Kana. All right, Rob, our thanks to you. Also tonight, authorities are turning to the public for help after a mass shooting at a weekend block party in Baltimore. At least two people were killed and nearly 30 more were wounded, most of them teenagers. Here's ABC's Ike Ajachi. Man, they started banging out here, bro. Tonight, the manhunt intensifying after a mass shooting at a Baltimore block party that killed two people and injured two dozen more. For the record, we don't have control of the scene. We don't have control. Tonight, police say multiple weapons were involved, and they believe more than one suspect. The reward growing. Now $28,000 for information leading to an arrest. We won't stop until we find those responsible and hold them accountable. Just after midnight Sunday, police were called about a shooting at what they describe as an unsanctioned block party. Witnesses telling us they heard 20 to 30 shots fired. Police say 18-year-old Alia Gonzalez died at the scene. 20-year-old Kylie's Fagbemi died later at a hospital. 28 other victims also treated, more than half between the ages of 13 and 17. We have uh, seven people that are still inpatient. Four of them remain in critical condition. It is devastating and it's hurtful. I'm tired of my people killing one another. This woman, who wanted to remain anonymous, says she was driving, looking for her own family when the shooting happened. And two injured girls came to her for help. And zoomed them to the hospital, and I kept telling the girl, just baby, just breathe in and out. And tonight, while his city heals, the mayor says this is not just a Baltimore problem. We have to be honest. This is the United States of America. This is our longest standing public health challenge, and we need to focus on gun violence regardless of where it happens.
And our thanks to Ike Ajachi for that reporting tonight. Also, we move on now to the major developments that are un unfolding in the Mideast tonight. Israel has launched the biggest strike in the West Bank in more than two decades, saying it has deployed drones and 2,000 troops to target militant strongholds. The death toll is rising, and there are concerns that the escalation is just beginning. Here's ABC's foreign correspondent, James Longman. Tonight, Israel's largest military operation into Palestinian territory in years is underway. Israeli defense forces have mounted multiple air and drone strikes on Jenin City in the occupied West Bank. As many as 2,000 Israeli troops sent in engaged in street battles, targeting what they call terrorist infrastructure in the refugee camp next to the city. Precision is difficult, with 17,000 people living in less than a quarter square mile. Palestinian officials say eight people have been killed and more than 60 injured. The Israeli raid today was a very tough one, this man says. Tough for medics as well as civilians inside the camp. Jenin has become a symbol of Palestinian resistance, disillusioned with the Palestinian Authority, who they feel has failed them. Some young men join terror groups who've carried out attacks against Israelis in more than a year of escalating violence. We are striking uh, the terrorism hub with a great strength. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has called on Israel to stop the aggression, saying it's Israel that sponsors terrorism in the region. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's facing ongoing protests, is under pressure by far-right members of his government who believe the entire West Bank should be under Israeli control. Tonight, he's pledged to continue this operation as long as required. And our thanks to James Longman for that reporting. Also, authorities in Florida have released new body camera video of the neighbor charged with allegedly shooting and killing a mother of two, firing a shot right through her own door. The video shows deputies responding to numerous calls leading up to the deadly confrontation. Our Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest, including what the accused shooter said about the children living next door. Tonight, body camera video revealing new details about the feud between two Florida neighbors that turned deadly. She calls constantly. Susan Lawrence making multiple calls to authorities about Ajika AJ Owens and her children for more than a year before she was charged with shooting and killing her. Put your class on. I called because the lady across the street on the phone hit me with the sign. In February of last year, Susan Lawrence alleging Owens picked up a no trespassing sign and threw it at her as she walked her dog on Lawrence's property. Sheriff deputies asking Owens for her side. I picked the sign up and I threw the sign. I literally picked the sign up and as I walked up, I threw the sign. I said, and I can go and buy a sign too. It still doesn't mean okay. anything. In April, Lawrence accusing Owens and her children of stealing her mail, calling her names and trespassing. How are you? Aggravated. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, I've got young ladies who just keep coming by and think it's hysterical while I'm working to um, bring their animals and scream while I'm on the phone. But police say on June 2nd, that feud turned deadly. Lawrence confronting Owens's children for playing a field near her residence. Lawrence allegedly throwing an iPad and skates at the children. When Owens later knocked at Lawrence's home, her 10-year-old son standing at her side, police say the neighbor fired a single shot through the front door, striking Owens in the chest and killing her. Lawrence charged with manslaughter and arraigned wearing a green suicide prevention vest. The sheriff's department saying she's been listed as a suicide risk. And Kena, the family of Owens, is pushing for Lawrence to be charged with murder. If convicted of manslaughter, she could face up to 30 years in prison. Kena? All right, Mona, our thanks to you. Also, authorities in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, now say four passengers died in a small plane crash on Sunday. The Piper aircraft went down near a golf course in the coastal community. Images showed smoke rising from the site. The pilot survived the impact but was seriously injured. The NTSB will investigate what caused that accident. Also, New York City police are on the alert for the 4th of July. NYPD saying that there are no known threats at this time, but they are increasing security throughout the city, citing previous incidents across the U.S. in recent years, including the deadly parade attack in Highland Park, Illinois, last year. A top concern is the possibility of a lone wolf attack. Also tonight, a revelation from superstar Kelly Clarkson. On a podcast, the singer revealed that she took antidepressants to help her through her divorce. She credits the antidepressants with helping her through her darkest moments. Ariel Reshef has that story.
pop icon Kelly Clarkson is known for wearing her emotions on her sleeve. Now, the Idol winner opening up for the first time about her decision to take antidepressants. I looked at my therapist and I was like, just yeah. couldn't stop sobbing. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying. Uh, I just, it was, yeah, I was like, I can't, I cannot do this. Speaking on the Las Culturistas podcast Wednesday, the 41 year old saying her therapist urged her to consider taking the medication while she was going through a divorce from ex husband Brandon Blackstock. My thing was, I just, I can't smile anymore for no. America right now. Yeah. Like I'm not help. happy and I need help. Yeah. And it was one of the best lessons because she kept trying to convince me. She was like, girl, you're doing a lot and having to balance a lot and trying to put my best foot forward in front of my kids. Like I was like, I can't do it. Clarkson says she was hesitant at first, but decided to use the antidepressant Lexapro temporarily during the split. Managing mental health can sometimes feel like an uphill battle. We know that uh, in these times of need, that if people can find support through other people's stories, this is actually what's able to help them manage their mental health in a better way. Now Clarkson says she's thankful for prioritizing her well-being. It was a really good lesson in like, you need to put your ego aside and like everything aside and someone's trying to help you. Yeah. Listen. And it was honest to God, the greatest decision ever. I wouldn't have made it. And our thanks to Ariel Russia for that reporting tonight. We have a lot more to get to here coming up. It's a TV series thriller that keeps fans guessing until the very end. Manuel Garcia Rolfo joins us to talk about the new season of The Lincoln Lawyer. But next, heavy rain causing flash flooding, resulting in hundreds being evacuated. The natural disaster officials fear could now. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from East Lansing, Michigan, I'm Alex Perez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. We're tracking several headlines from around the world. The French justice minister is calling for a tough response to rioters who've been protesting the police killing of a teenager of North African descent. The police officer who shot the teen when he failed to cooperate during a traffic stop is under investigation. Since the shooting, unrest has rocked cities across France, but it appears to be abating. Fewer than 160 people were arrested overnight. And heavy rain drenching both China and Japan. In southwestern China, hundreds of people are being evacuated after the area received four inches of rain in three hours. According to state broadcaster CCTV, triggering flash floods in the area's river valleys, 
and in central Japan. At least one person was killed, two are missing. The country's weather agency has issued its highest level landslide warning now as the rain is forecasted to continue. And in the UK, Wimbledon got underway today. Eager fans camped outside for the gates uh, for those last minute tickets. In the coming weeks, tennis fans will be watching to see if Novak Djokovic can clinch a few more records and if Venus Williams will remain on top. Netflix, The Lincoln Lawyer, is returning this week. Mickey Holler is back to take on cases big and small across the expansive city of Los Angeles. Let's take a look. Hey, you're that lawyer from the news, aren't you? Yes, guys, but I'm in the middle of something. I know what you're thinking. Mickey Holler, the hottest defense attorney in L.A., hard at work. Are you mean that stupid magazine? Ooh, fantastic, yeah. You know I don't care about that stuff. <laughs> Actor Manuel Garcia Rolfo is here to talk about the new season and his role as the idealist lawyer who runs his practice out of the back of his Lincoln cars. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I love the shot of you driving down the PCH there. I know exactly where that's at. <laughs> Thank uh, you. That's last, valuable, yeah. Yeah. So last season, your character handled, you know, all these messy twists and turns of a tech billionaire accused right. of murdering his wife. What can you tell us about the big cases he's working on this season? Well, like you say, um, you know, we find Mickey after that big case that he won in the first season, you know, in the top of the of uh, top of the world, you know, being like the hottest uh, attorney in L.A. or the hottest lawyer of the moment. So, <laughs> you know, he get this case that it's it becomes more personal because there's a love affair there that I can't talk about it, but uh -oh. it just makes it more I don't know more more a little more spicy, a little more exciting and. The pace move faster is a huge case, and I think, I don't know, it's just, it's just really, really fun. Is there a nugget you can tell us, that spice? I mean, when you're reading these scripts, right, what excited you the most? Um, I don't know. What I was reading th this season, every time I read one episode, it just felt, when I finished it, it just felt like the end of a season. So, like I said, it's, it's just more more exciting. Uh, but I don't know, there's uh, some characters that come in this season that, uh, you know, they bring a lot of, uh, not a lot, but they bring some comedy to, to, the, to the show. Uh, you know, there's the character of my mom, that the dynamic between her and, and Mickey is very, very funny. Um, so that, and then some love interested with Mickey that those characters are amazing. Lana plays a character that's insane. Yeah. Well, it's fun to watch you talk about it. You're smiling so much, you can tell how much fun you're having. And, you know, the whole story arc, it really is around your character, right? But you just spoke about so many other characters that are supporting you along this way in the cast. Is there any other story exploration that we'll see? Maybe the private investigator? Yeah, I think uh, in this series, uh, we dig in more into the other, you know, into the characters that... Um, the team of Mickey Holler, which is, you know, Cisco, his investigator, and... and and Lorna and is, um, you know, so you start seeing more of her, of, of, of their of their stories, which is really, I don't know, they're really fun and, and amazing, and that you can you can start to understand the dynamic between the whole team more. Um, so yeah, you you'll see more of, uh, you know, we'll explore more of those characters for sure. There's a beautiful history behind this show. Matthew McConaughey first played your character in the film version of The Lincoln Lawyer. How did it feel to bring your own perspective to this character, especially being given the opportunity to include your Mexican heritage? Uh, it's so fun. I mean, I'm very, very uh, blessed, uh, very happy to have this opportunity to play Mickey Holler. Like you said, you know, having the shadow of one of the most charismatic actors out there, which is Matthew McConaughey's. You know, at the beginning is like, oh my God, am I? Why am I doing this? This is, you know. <laughs> but I, I guess you just have to, uh, you know, jump and do it and hope for the best. It's fantastic, and you have another upcoming venture with Netflix: the screen adaptation of Pedro Parmo based on a oh, prominent well, yes. piece of Mexican literature. Tell us about that. Yes, it's a very, it's one of those projects that you know I'm really, really proud and excited uh, that comes one in a, in a lifetime. Um, you know that book. Every Mexican, you know, we, we read it when we're, you know, in high school or mm -hmm. it's one of, like you said, it's one of the most uh, important pieces of literature, not just from Mexico, but Latin America. And, you know, he's the father of magic realism. So 
we grew up with that and and he's from my hometown and he's he's a relative you know the author of mine so it's very personal you're fantastic what a beautiful project to take on yes. Manuel, thank you so much for no, joining okay. us thank we you appreciate so much. it thank you yeah. so much of course and part <laughs> one of the new season premieres july 6th part two will be out august 3rd <laughs> thank you and still to come here tonight, a true reflection of what can happen when you don't give up. The accomplishment a girls rugby team is celebrating one year after a season with no wins. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. It's a sport gaining popularity in America, girls rugby. And one team in Philadelphia is now the state champion. But this is just after their last season where they didn't have a single win. And one player on the team is even being selected to Pennsylvania's all-state team. Our Jacqueline Lee has the underdog story and a look at the positive impact the sport is having on young women. I love them. They're, uh, they're kind of the most impressive group of girls that I've, I've ever met. Last year, rugby coach Nick Hunter started a girls rugby team for students at Cristo Ray High School in Philadelphia. I'm a health and PE teacher, so um, in, in classes with my kids, I introduced them to the game, and when they said they wanted to play, we, we got a club together. Even though the team lost every single game in their first season, the girls came back this year, recruiting their friends to join too. We came into our first tournament expecting to lose every game, and to learn as much as possible. But they won 10 of their 11 games, making them the Division II state champs. If you would have said last year that we was going to win all these games this year, I wouldn't have never thought that. Co-captain Anaya Skinner played many different sports growing up, but rugby is now her favorite. On a scale of 1 and 10, like an 11. I love it. She's ferocious. Anaya gets the loose ball, makes the pass, sacrifices her body, and makes somebody else better. She's a very selfless athlete. Nationally, there are around 500 girls rugby programs, and registrations are up 20% this year. Rugby is also an emerging sport in higher education. 30 colleges have NCAA-level programs. It's necessary that they are able to look at the the sport and the culture as it is and see themselves in it. We did an HBCU trip to Howard University this year where they got to meet the Howard women's team, the University of Maine Farmington team. It's no surprise that Anaya wants to continue playing after graduation next year. She was the only Division II player to be selected for Pennsylvania's All-State team. I don't want to stop when I leave high school. I only got one more year left. I want to keep playing. Rugby is one of the only sports in the world where the rules are exactly the same for boys and girls. It's a full contact sport where the players don't wear any padding. One of the positives for Anaya and her teammates is that the sport is an outlet to release any tensions they're feeling. Right on three, one, two, three. Ah! Another benefit for the girls, a family. It's like a group of sisters. It's like even if we're not like bonded by blood, but we're just kind of like bonded through this team. We all love each other. We all take care of each other on and off the field. And it's just... It's just like you can go to anybody on the team and just know they're going to be there for you. It's just, it's just a family, one big family, you know? Jacqueline Lee, ABC News, New York.
Oh, don't underestimate the toughness of American young women. Thank you, Jacqueline, for that story. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Kana Whitworth. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families.